Okay, so we are at the top of the hour. We shall get started. Discant, a form of expression in which a fixed melody is accompanied through improvisation. Point and counterpoint leading to a greater awareness, leading to something more, something unique, something that is above the book. My name is Kevin Feenan. I'm the founder of Rockcliffe University Consortium, and I'd like to introduce Patch Linden as our guest for this above the book session. Patch Linden is vice president of product operations at Linden Lab, where he works to bring the best of product and support decisions on a daily operational basis, to the virtual world platform for Second Life. He also maintains oversight on how all of the various teams within Linden Lab can best work together for the highest good of the residents and the business. Patch started as a resident in 2004 before joining the lab in 2007. Prior to joining the lab, he held leadership roles focused on customer service and product development, where he always maintained a customer first focus while striving to deliver best in class products and services. Patch has a deep passion for creative, uh, for creativity and uses that to bring enjoyment to others. He continues to evolve his skills to include virtual worlds, 3D design, 3D printing, modeling, photography, and filmography. Patch, welcome to Above the Book. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. So, Let's get started with a few questions that we had talked about um, prior to us coming on stage here. Sure. Um, obviously, the sort of elephant in the room is the fact that Linden Research has been purchased. Yes. Yeah, it actually went very smoothly. Um, I... Uh, uh, you know, couldn't probably have asked for a better transition um, from our former owners to our new owners. Um, and our new ownership team uh, is is a, a joy to work with. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, uh, Brad in particular is a, is a lot of fun uh, to be to be around and, and to work with. I, I, I very much appreciate having him on. Board. So what what is this going to mean for the Second Life residents? Because obviously we've got Randy Waterfield, we've got Brad uh, Oberwager. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yep, Oberwager. Yeah, and then there's also uh, Raj Date, which we hadn't heard of until recently. Yeah, so the 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 team is comprised of um, the the three as you mentioned, Randy, Raj, and um, Brad's Linden name is Oberwolf. And, um, you know, they, 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 they form our board and the, you know, the, the, the person that I primarily work with though is, is, is Brad. He is the owner of the, and, um, uh, I interface with him the most on a, on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we will be working together, um, on, uh, everything that has to do with Second Life and going into the future. Um, Brad has one mission for Second Life, uh, and that is to uh, be the best and biggest virtual world there can be. Uh, he um, wants to grow Second Life, invest in Second Life, and, um, uh, you know, he, he, he genuinely loves the product. Um, I have spent a ton of time in Second Life with him already and continue to do so. Uh, and it's very evident uh, that uh, th this was um, a, a well-made match for us. So I do need to ask, though, because obviously these, uh, well, with the exception of Raj, the they come from the, the uh, Tilla side of things. Tilia. Tilia. That was their primary focus prior to Second Life. So how is that going to work? Because they've come from that side 
but yet they're now investing in Second Life. Um, so, well, R Randy, um, you know, owns an investment firm, uh, and they see um, Tilia also as a business that is going to grow and prosper, um, and Raj is in the industry um, on that side as well, and uh, Brad um, sits kind of in the middle, uh, as it were, in my opinion, um, and balances both. Tilia as a uh, an entity or a business uh, is what allows Second Life to continue to exist um, and to have its uh, open market economy with the Lindex and being able to cash out. Um, you know, there, there's there's definitely a symbiotic relationship between the two, um, and you know that won't change going forward. And um, you know, Tilia will definitely grow. Uh, as time goes on, and you know that's in the best interest of everybody that Tilia is successful because it enables Second Life to exist. Right. So, are these two entities then are they truly separate, or is there like is Linden Research? Uh, no, there's, yeah, they're still generally under the same umbrella, um, but you know we we do think of them kind of as two two separate entities or businesses because Second Life is. In that regards, in kind of a relationship as a customer, Tilia's. Right. So, uh, as bear, bearing in mind, I mean, the the community has seen different uh, strategic priorities as we've gone forward over over the last ten years or so. And I guess what I'm concerned about, and I'm sure other people are as well, is whether or not one side or the other is going to become more dominant. Um, I don't. I don't. So, well, actually, but, if you bear with me for a moment, let me let me expand upon that a little bit further. Uh, one of the things that we know that the Kitely folks have talked about is that. The Kitely platform is enabling their marketplace, and therefore their true focus is really on the marketplace. Right. And so I guess what I'm wondering about is whether or not we're seeing the start of something similar here, or whether uh, you know, truly that second second life is really, you know, the, the primary focus. Well, Second Life for us in our business um, within the Linden ecosphere is our primary focus. Um, you know, uh, anybody that you talk to um, within our, uh, you know, within our sphere of influence that has to work on or uh, will work on Second Life, that is our focus. We do not, like, I do not focus on Tilia. Um, I focus primarily on Second Life product and the residents uh, and Grumpity focuses on the product, Second Life and Engineering and the residents as well, uh, you know, and so in, in that sense, right, that is where kind of that separation starts to be seen. Um, you know, there is a separate team um, with a separate focus that works on and focuses on Tilia, whereas we don't. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, having said that, then, what are the immediate priorities over the next uh, 12 months or so for the Second Life team in terms of business and product development? The immediate priorities are to grow Second Life. Uh, we want to increase uh, the resident population, uh, and, and that's very much being driven uh, also as a goal by Brad. The uh, the team wants to finish up uh, you know, the last bits and pieces of the AWS work that we've generally completed. Um, there's still some stuff there to be done uh, and some future product enhancements that will potentially come out of having done that work. Uh, and uh, the new user experience are key um, on our mind as long as, you know, or as alongside of us growing the product. Um, we are going to be 
drilling deep down into the new user onboarding experience for Second Life, um, factoring it and already worked. So that's that's kind of the 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 twelve month you know high level roadmap, you know, and then of course there's bits and pieces and details and stuff that you know lead up to that uh, as well. Right. So from the new user experience standpoint, um, if that's one of the the core product development features that we're going to see, currently there's a number of groups such as virtual abilities, such as Rockcliffe, that have gateways for people to come into Second Life. Um, and I realize I'm sort of throwing this at you at the last moment. How How is that new user experience going to impact those of us that have gateways? Primarily, you're going to see us, like I said, we're, 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 we're refactoring the entire um, new user experience and new user orientation region. Uh, onboarding process from the sense of uh, what you see and what you get in world. Um, I don't want to go too far into detail about what's to come. Uh, there's there's a lot of work going on. A lot of it is going to be both viewer um, enablement and changes uh, that will smooth out uh, a lot of the bumps in the road that we've identified over the past uh, couple of years that we've been doing a lot of testing, lots of A-B testing uh, and such to, you know, figure out what this path needs to look like in today's world going forward. Um, and having come through the pandemic and, and everything we've learned about a lot of the turning users coming back to Second Life and getting feedback even from them and listening and understanding what they're seeing and feeling, it's kind of given us a lot of uh, stuff that we can latch on to, make improvements from, design a series of changes that we think are going to really help, you know, everyone, even the gateways from hopefully like a uh, an example, uh, you know, to where the changes that we will uh, incorporate in the viewer going forward uh, that will help cater to, to some of the work that we're doing uh, will hopefully also help and benefit everybody else in the sense that, you know, new UIs and, and refreshed looks and easier to find information um, will just benefit everybody across the board. Right. And uh, we were talking about Grumpity uh, a little bit before we came up here. How much of accessibility um, is going to be built into a, to a lot of the new user experience? So Grumpy always has her eye on looking for opportunities to improve accessibility. Uh, that also, of course, plays a large factor in UI in the viewer, right? And and how it looks, works, feels, uh, and operates. And you know, there's there's uh, on the team, all of our UI, absolute wizard at figure to make stuff more straightforward, easier to access informationally between all of us and, and included, um, there will definitely be applied where we can, when we to just improve general viewer accessibility. Um, but I don't think that necessarily says that, yeah, hey, we're going to build text-to-speech into the viewer tomorrow. Um, but, you know, UI improvements and interface improvements, absolutely. So where where do we see sort of Second Life trying to get themselves positioned three to five years from now, especially in comparison to other you know competitors trying to break into this space? Well, um, again, going back to our general missive and, and goal for growth, um, we want to double the resident population or more uh, over the next three to five years. The uh, the goals I think are are very realistic um, for us to be able to do so. As we have seen this recent shift, and over the past year, of course, um, pandemic uh, of 
both educator educational facilities and schools and uh, businesses alike switching from in person only to either you know mixed or hybrid solutions between you know some in world some real life mix of uh, you know operation along with some of them just going completely remote and virtual um, you know that will also play a large part into what we see you know kind of affecting the prioritization yeah you, yeah you you mentioned the experience over the last 12 months is there a possibility that we're going to see the reintroduction of the teen grid or something similar for K through 12 educational groups so we we do already have some educational groups that are operating um, down in that space, um, and and particularly through you know our educational partners. Um, there's not a lot of them, you know. It's not not a, not not by any you know sense of the means, but um, you know we are we are open to being able to to do those things, and you know the work that we have been doing with AWS and, and putting Second Life up there, um, you know, will help open more doors to being able to do such things. Um, you know, probably towards the end of the year, uh, we will see things like geographically aided capabilities. Uh, so schools and educational facilities uh, in other locations around the world potentially benefit from having their regions uh, and such hosted geographically closer to them for mm -hmm. better performance and speed. And when we cross that bridge, that could also then further open the doors to doing, um, you know, private or white label grids or age range specific setups, uh, et cetera. And I think that's that's something that's probably a good, good little bit down the road, still even beyond getting geographic uh, region placement solved. Um, but you know, it certainly looks like something that we 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 could feasibly attempt to do again. Right. I think there's a number of people that would be highly interested in that uh, if it were to come about. You, uh, you've mentioned AWS, and obviously the move to the cloud uh, has uh, just recently been completed. At the same time, you also just mentioned that um, geolocation is not necessarily something that's currently part of that. Did I understand that correctly? It is part of it. It's not part of today's work right this moment, but it is coming. It is coming. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, I would love to delve into the technical aspect of that, but I'm just, <laughs> I told myself I wouldn't. <laughs> yes, we could probably make an entire show out of that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. Um, what else have, like, based on the COVID pandemic experience and the needs of various different groups, not just educators? What else has the lab learned over the past year that you didn't or you weren't aware of prior to this mess that we're in right at the moment happening? Learnings. You know, there, there's there's been probably a handful of, of takeaways, and and some of them may already be may or may just be reinforcements of what. We may be latently new. Um, for example, uh, the new user experience needing significant work. Um, between both new users coming into Second Life for the first time again, but in a different sense, not for personal reasons, for you know education and business use reasons, you know specifically, kind of put a pin. The fact that in this post-pandemic world that we're now living in, it's even more important to be addressed. 
um, and to smooth that experience out and, and to give it some love, as it were. The, the other things that we have uh, learned have been um, people's usage habits have changed over time. Um, and they are also specifically different for education and business needs. Um, you know, there are all sorts of different use cases out there. And again, we could we could probably spend all day talking about all the different use cases and stuff. But being able to kind of compartmentalize and understand each one of the different types of use cases and also try to gather them up and cater to them all um, has been really interesting to watch. Um, my my product ops team, um, and or sometimes we refer to it as the land ops team, um, are the ones that primarily handle a lot of the business requests that come in, right? Business at lindenlab.com, uh, and those go to that team. We oversee a lot of the stuff that comes in and help uh, handhold the various contacts that are coming in and get them to where they need to be. Whether that's standing up uh, one of the many pre-built solutions that we already have in place for people or businesses to use, to school facilities, to um, potentially matching them up with a solution provider to, you know, take care of their longer term needs. Um, you know, we, we certainly get a lot of insight into directly what people are coming to us tell us as far as what they need to operate today um, for their businesses and their educational needs. So that has had a whole entire kind of scope of uh, information and learning and understanding how we can best service their needs um, that have come with that. So as part of that, as businesses and educational groups come forward with new uh, business cases, the obviously there's a series of feature requests that would come along with that, and then those would be considered as part of the environment. Are you guys, you had mentioned private labeling uh, mm -hmm. earlier, uh, white labeling. Is the intention that a lot of these features would go into specific white label products, or is the intention that you're going to bring them into the core Second Life uh, application itself, such that they're available to everybody? I like flexibility. <laughs> so I'm going to answer that as one, either, or both. Um, <laughs> you know, we've had it come both ways. We've had some clients come to us and say, I need you to remove half the features in the viewer, for example, for us to be able to use it as a client. Um, or we've had people come and say, I need, right, the additions, the X, Y, and Z top of what you have. And, you know, we've said yes. For example, um, and as you are familiar, one of them is being used right now in these regions. What it is? Da, 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 da. Trivia. Open chat range. Yeah. Right? So, you know, there's one of those features as a prime example of, you know, putting, taking a request that had come in as a, uh, you know, a need for events in general. Um, and was largely driven by educational conferences and business conferences. And, you know, we, we do a lot of this like four region border setup, right, to increase our ability to have a lot of density of um, avatars here at one time. And they said, well, the one thing that is, you know, not great about this whole thing is that people outside of each other's chat ranges can't hear you know, text chat. We said, well, let's fix that. Another one was um, the recent work that we've done on the Chrome Embedded Framework Viewer for being able to use uh, YouTube streaming or YouTube Live natively within the Second Life Viewer, and it, and it works great. So, you know, some of these features, absolutely, as they come in, um, you know, and as we can match uh, value for, for having them, 
you know, we have to make the determination if that's something that is for the good of the entire product and the community. And, you know, a lot of times I think it would pan out that way. Um, I don't know if we would ever single out a feature uh, request that somebody would bring to us and we would only implement it for them. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. But like I said earlier, there's also the opposite of we're we're asked to remove features uh, and such from time to time and to have their use cases. Hey, heathens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, I don't want the, the folks in my business ring to be able to use uh, search right within the viewer. We want everybody to be on their own isolated little island and not go outside of it. Um, and thus, we also don't want them to be able to search Second Life. Uh, okay. Right, which I could understand. I mean, there's certainly a business case for that. Uh, business and educational, from a safety perspective, especially. Oh, goodness, yes. As a matter of fact, the Teen Grid uh, had that feature embedded as part of it, if I remember correctly. And well, Team Grid had its own search, and the Main Grid had its own search, and the, the two didn't talk to each other. Same thing with all of the systems, really. I mean, like the friends lists and everything, the groups, it was all separate. I just remember I could hop back and forth between the two grids as a Linden whenever I had to go over there and work on stuff. <laughs> the. Um... With regards to other product placements, are, are there other th and outside of the new user experience, is there other products, uh, products or features that you guys are looking at uh, bringing into the environment that educators or nonprofits could be looking forward to over the next twelve months? Well, like I said, I think. I think the biggest one that could be the most impactful would be the geographic region location stuff. Um, the new user experience um, and UI refinements for the viewer uh, would certainly help and make things easier from an onboarding perspective. Um, yeah, and then we've we've got a lot of kind of uh, performance tweaking uh, and such that we will be working on uh, over the year in the background to, uh, you know, increase efficiency and leverage AWS more to its potential uh, going forward. Um, and, and I'm sure there's something I'm not thinking of in between there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, kind of the key, um, especially because they Sorry, I think I missed that last part. Uh, I said, and there are some things that I'm probably not thinking of, but for the most part, those are the key key things on the forefront of my mind. Oh, okay, all right, cool. Um, pricing, payment options, other value-added options with regards to the, the structure here. I know... You guys made changes uh, last year with the reduction in the uh, amounts for educators and for nonprofits. Are there other things that are coming along in that regard? Uh, I don't have anything new on the roadmap for, for pricing, and that I hope is a, is a good thing because we're not looking to increase costs. Uh, I would like to leave them status quo, uh, and they will remain status quo. Uh, for the rest of the year, uh, we 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 did we de we <laughs> we decreased the cost or increased the discount, however you want to look at it. Um, you know, for full regions, uh, you know, they're ninety nine dollars. Uh, you know, they're invoiceable. Um, you know, six month, one year term, or or you can pay for the monthly. Um, you know, I I don't foresee any changes there. Uh, it it would potentially be interesting um, if AWS. Uh, allows us to uh, potentially get into some new region products. I don't think that's the next 12 months, but maybe in the 12 months following, so 24 months. Uh, 
out view. Um, you know, maybe we could look at some new or different land uh, or region models. Um, mega regions? Do what? Mega? Mega regions? Ma maybe. Maybe it's mega regions. Maybe it's uh, a, a light region product, something between like a homestead and a full region would be fun to think about. Um, you know, Grumpy's probably going to like choke me or something after this, but, um, you know, I would love to put thought into what that could potentially mean for me as a middle cost alternative instead, or if they would be valuable to people. Um, mega region certainly is, is always on my mind. Um, and the, uh, the notion of being able to get more avatar density in a particular region uh, is certainly very attractive uh, as it lessens or increases, depending on how you look at it, uh, the ability uh, to have people in a large, large gathering space like this one with four regions, right? Um, could we double that? I don't know. Probably take some testing. But uh, uh, having AWS and the ability to scale up computer power on the back end to actually rise to meet there gets easier over this next year as we continue to do more of that work to potentially enable something new like that. Uh, something else that I've been tinkering with in the background is on-demand spin-up uh, of regions for events in the sense that we have regions that are out there today uh, that folks use for events that are like homesteads, and they want to run like a really big event, but they can't make the jump to a full region. So uh, I have been experimenting with allowing those people to do short temporary upgrades from homesteads to fulls and back down just to cater to their events. It's hard to manage that manually, so I can't necessarily release this as a new product tomorrow. Uh, it's something we do because it would be hard to scale, um, but we are experimenting with it. And if it if it looks like it will work well, that could be another one. That that would be interesting. I know Kitely has a couple of interesting features on their platform, which would be interesting to see replicated over here. Uh, but that's like I said, that's sort of another topic in terms of features, which we'll talk about later. Um, I want to talk, speaking of Kitely, though, um, I want to talk about the competitive landscape because obviously there is a lot of renewed interest in virtual 3D environments. So we have, obviously, there's Kitely, there's OpenSim. Those have been around for for quite some time. But then you also have Oculus, you've got HoloLenses, you've got Apple's coming out with their own, you know, twist on this. Uh, there's ScienceBase, there's other groups that are trying to compete against you guys. Um, how are you guys looking at managing that competition? Well, uh, you know, I I like competition. It it helps foster innovation. Uh, it drives you to uh, stay motivated and um, <laughs> I guess engage in friendly one-upmanship within the uh, you know the platform ecosphere uh, and uh, in the competition space. So uh, you know I. I always keep an eye on uh, our closest competitors and what they're doing and features that they may be onboarding. You know, being kind of the, uh, I guess the, the, the oldest, um, one of the oldest virtual platforms in the world, uh, you know, there are a lot of features that we have that others are catching up to. And then there's some new and innovative, interesting features that others, uh, you know, are, are latching on to. Some of them are um, different takes on features that we already have, like how they maybe handle their economies. Bitcoin versus Linden dollar, for example. Uh, blockchain 
content versus our content model uh, and such. And so watching and learning on how they're handling each of the unique challenges that those tend to uh, versus how we've done it uh, has been pretty interesting. And, you know, uh, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the core of some of the key strengths that Second Life um, has always brought to the table, um, you know, besides volume and size, uh, generally is flexibility. Um, I still struggle to find a competitor, like a real direct competitor, that offers the unique and open flexibility that Second Life as a platform just throws on the table and, um, you know, is is really hard to find elsewhere. Um, you know, there's almost nowhere that you can go that uh, you can do pretty much anything endlessly uh, within the confines of the boundaries of how many attachments you can attach to your avatar and how many prims you can have in a region um, you can get in the that stuff anywhere else. Um, you know Second Life still has the unique property as well as having an inbuilt open world build tool um, whereas other platforms, for example, force you through a development pipeline to actually make content outside and then bring it in. We all know that you can do that in Second Life too, right? Maya, Mesh, Import, and so on as the pipeline goes. Uh, but there, there are plenty of the other competitors out there that that is the only pipeline and not everybody has the technical proclivity to harness or master things like Maya and Blender to build their world out for them. Will they have the best looking thing all the time? Potentially if they don't utilize those tools to today's standards across the board, maybe not, but will they have something that's functional and still usable? Yes. The um, the entire platform was basically, I think, the, the third in a series of experiments by uh, Philip Rosedale. Because I believe this is like the third platform that he tried to develop, right? And then obviously going from here to... Um... Shoot, I have forgotten the name now. <laughs> Uh, it depends on which one you're considering a platform, but High Fidelity is probably the most notorious of recent. Yeah, sorry, that was the one that I was thinking of, High Fidelity. Uh, the name slipped me there for a moment. Um, obviously, the opportunity to experiment and innovate is crucial to maintaining the competitive advantage of these, these particular platforms. Do you guys have a, or sort of like a Skunk Works type group with Inside Second Lab that all they get to do is play with, you know, different things like what your competitors are working with? Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think we have a particular <laughs> group of folks that engage in. I mean, we, we all engage in going out and uh, trying new platforms, learning about them. Uh, you know, that's especially true amongst, you know, self grump and that even. Um, and then certainly a handful of and product ops who, you know, again, in handling a lot of that incoming traffic, when somebody comes in and says, you know, hey, how do you handle this thing like what we found over in or something like that, um, or uh, sign space. And we we may actually jump out and go say, let's find out and let's compare the differences and come back and discuss that. Um, and so, you know, we actually have this kind of innate, uh, you know, kind of thing where, or process where um, just to, you know, the folks within the team go out and, and look at these things and then they come back and they bring back feedback and they say, you know, hey, they're doing this really well. Or, you know, hey, we're doing this better than they do. 
Um, and so now we understand that point, you know, vice versa, et cetera. Um, so, you know, from the standpoint of, um, you know, uh, I, I, I guess learning how one versus the other does something, you know, yeah, we, we do go out and do that and we do understand it as an assigned group of folks. No, not per se. Um, but we do, we do triage it. Yeah, I, I guess where the question was sort of coming from is that we've seen various experiments, so to speak, uh, over the years where a new feature has been introduced to the platform, either in full or based upon a limited viewer. And we get to play around with it for a little while. And then after a bit, it's withdrawn. So uh, I believe with Sansar, you guys tried to do full, full on uh, 3D VR using the, the headset glasses. Uh, and there was talk about doing that inside Second Life, and I think there was, in fact, a, a viewer at one point that would allow us to do that, but then again was withdrawn right, due to the bandwidth requirements. So in a lot of these cases, like when you get an idea to a point where you think, okay, you know, we this might be something that is worth exploring, like truly exploring. Um, is it normally the case that we're going to get, like, to a certain extent, we, we're going to become your beta testers for that? Or not that I don't mind being a beta tester. I will sign up for being a beta tester in 30 seconds, right? <laughs> but Yeah, I mean, and, and that's probably the case with anything new that we might attempt to do. If if it's some new big revolutionary thing, uh, you know, we're going to want to study its usefulness, its uptake is important. Um, and, you know, that, of course, has some magic back end uh, blend of what does it take and uh, what is the ROI to maintain it, right? And I think that that's true of any business. Uh, with any product, um, you know, uh, speaking to like VR headset stuff, add a VR headset capable Second Life viewer, uh, and the, the maintenance to, to both maintain it and its at the time lack of performance, you know, caused us to have to take pause with it and stop. Um, you know, Second Life and its it, with as great as it is, um, you know, if it can't sustain 65 FPS fairly steadily, or at least north of 50, call it, uh, you know, uh, it, it can cause problems, right, with motion sickness. Etc. Um, so you have to, as a business, assess, is it worth maintaining something that's suboptimal for the good of the residents in the community and the product? And sometimes that answer, unfortunately, tilts to no. Um, but it's still worth, you know, when something new comes up and we want to experiment with it and we want to put it in people's hands and learn and understand that sort of feedback and how that will be received and utilized. Such that's, that's of course, very important that we would put it out there. You know, we have, we have test viewers in the pipeline right now uh, and they're always there uh, with various new features in test just for that reason. And we watch, listen, and learn and gather that feedback and act on it. Cool. Um, I do have a uh, – I'm going to sort of switch topics for a moment. Um, I was reading the other day that Oz Linden is retiring. Um, I thought it was in his contract he wasn't allowed to. <laughs> I think I think that was our sentiment too. <laughs> but yes, Oz Oz did retire. Um and uh you know, I um I loved and adored Oz. He was uh, an absolute fabulous colleague to work with over the years. Um he he leaves a, a gaping chasm uh in his in his wake of leaving. Um but you know, good on him. Uh you know, 
we all wish him the best and um you know uh just boo <laughs> now we've got to find somebody new <laughs> Is is there a um, – obviously, talent is a huge issue right at the moment. Um, Blizzard, for example, is going through this – You know, if you listen to the YouTube videos and what have you, they're going through this massive brain drain uh, in terms of their organization. Um, how are we set up for recruiting and retaining talent? Uh, I don't think we're set up any differently from most. Uh, you know, when when we when we need to recruit or find talent, uh, you know, we we post it on the website. Uh, we have uh, internal recruiters who uh, know where to and have the resources on where to find uh, great talent. Um, and I pretty much let them handle that. That's their area of expertise. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just checking my notes here just to cross check that. I, to be honest, I think we've actually covered most everything that we said we were going to. Um, Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm trying to think of other questions that are not going to deep dive into features because like I said I'd really love to have a you know a half a day or a full day with you just on that subject alone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh I I mean, I'll circle back around to just because I know the ownership thing is like always on everybody's mind and um you know, the the new owners are bringing just this tremendous new energy. Uh, to to Second Life and us and the team, um, and like I said, they're super enthusiastic about uh, you know growing Second Life. Uh, even even they recognize uh, growing the educational community. Um, you know, and, and just in general, the overall health and growth of the platform, and um, you know what gets invested back into it as far as features and upgrades will only benefit us all. Um, Randy always makes me ask a key question about everything I do. Brad always makes me ask a question about everything that I think of doing. And that is, how will it benefit the residents? And how will it benefit Second Life? And I always ask myself those questions, and I have for years. Um, but to hear that come from him with the energy such that he brings immediately told me he gets Walk in the resident's shoes. Well, I think that's very good to hear. Uh, certainly, we've, we've seen both sides of that coin uh, over the years. And so to... To have an understanding that the new uh, ownership structure understands that, I think, is is going to be a huge relief to, to a lot of people. Yeah, and you know, I am always open to to feedback and discussions and engaging conversations. Uh, you know, we don't always have to do it in a show like this. Um, I welcome anybody with open out to me. I'm a pretty busy guy. It might take me a little bit to get back to you, but you know, I would invite anybody that has feedback at any time uh, to contact me directly, and you know, let's talk about it. Let's uh, let's exchange uh, information and notes on what it is you're thinking about doing and what you would like to see. Um, I I thrive on that. Uh, it's always kind of been part of what I do, and uh, it's hugely important to me. Bigly even. That was a bad joke. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, very cool. And yes, sometimes I have a weird sense of humor, but you know. No, that's 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 very cool. So, Patch, I would like to thank you very, very much for coming out here and and sharing your time with us. Uh, I know that we have more people from the lab coming by tomorrow for a roundtable. 
And then I believe you're going to be back again on Saturday. Uh, I think I'm back tomorrow, um, but not Saturday. Okay, I have it back to front. This this is why LV is the program's chair and I'm not, right? <laughs> The, but I'd like again. I'd like to thank you very, very much for spending some time with us. I do appreciate this, and I'm quite sure that uh, there is a lot of things that uh, uh, we're going to come up with in terms of uh, you know, features, business cases that we'd love to talk about and share uh, over the next uh, several months. Yeah, I, I I look forward to digging in. Uh, I think we might even do that a little bit over the next couple of days. Um, and I'm I excited. hope so. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And to everybody else here in the audience, uh, again, thank you for being here with us. Um, I believe we have one more session at uh, four o'clock coming up in lecture A, if I remember correctly. So hopefully you will get a chance to join us there. Great, hey, thank you for having me. And thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you. Oh, and a quadrivium session. <laughs>